Good afternoon. Today is Sunday, August 16th, 2020, and it's about 2.30 p.m. here in Pasadena, California, and here's the update for the past week. So the discussion is ongoing right now uh, with uh, Clipper Daryl. If you remember from uh, several years ago, actually Clipper has been involved for pretty much from the beginning. Um, this idea was brought up about a year ago uh, when Jason was still here. Uh, talking about possibly putting together something, uh, a celebrity sports league. So I brought that up again because thinking about it, especially now in the age of COVID-19, uh, the fact that you can't have fans in the stands, that's actually a logistical issue that we don't have to deal with. So uh, bringing this idea back up again, I brought it up with Alper that, uh, you know, Clippers, obviously a base basketball uh, fan. I mean, that's his claim to fame, being the number one Clippers super fan. Uh, you know, what about putting together a three-on-three -three celebrity basketball league? Uh, Clipper knows everybody in basketball. I was uh, with an event. Actually, I think we, we helped uh, sponsor one of his events where uh, Lamar Odom was one of the, the, the guests there. So uh, I've talked to him many times about uh, basketball related things. And, you know, everybody knows him, everybody, he knows everybody in, in basketball. So uh, I also didn't realize thinking about this, that Alper is a huge basketball fan. And so uh, the result of all that was that he thinks it's a really good idea because obviously the circumstances have changed drastically in the last year. Um, it really comes down to just recruiting people who would be interested uh, finding a basketball court that's regulation that is acceptable, um, hiring, you know, or, or getting some people to help us out with the refereeing and that sort of thing, having a clean facility, which is something that is already necessary because of COVID-19 for ACE, you know, the, the whole clean studio concept is actually part of his business model now. So putting together a, a basketball stage is really nothing more than finding a regulation basketball court and then putting it in stage ready condition uh, like you would for a television show or a movie and then bringing in the players um, and combining, you know, using the celebrity aspect, which is of course is gonna be good for them. And, and for us, I think it's very viable and very easy to do. So uh, Alper is in agreement that this is something we wanna really get serious about. In fact, he's already talking to Clipper about it right now. Uh, the conversation is underway, so we'll see where it leads. My thought here was then rather than just waiting on one of the interested leagues to close, then why don't we just put our own order in uh, or at least put that option on the table to take that uh, waiting game out of the picture. So combined with um, the educational side, remember too that Clipper is involved in the uh, school system in Los Angeles County. So there's that part which also ties in. So uh, as we get a, a, a better understanding of the whole concept and especially after bouncing it off a of clipper and how viable it is to recruit uh, a minimum viable number of people to participate, once that discussion is finished and has reached some sort of a conclusion, then, then we'll report back uh, I do feel very, I'm very excited about the idea and so is Alper and I do think it's workable and I think it's workable through Clippers Connections and especially given the conditions we're in now, um, you know, you remove the entire thing of fans. So really it's just a matter of being able to uh, broadcast the games, keep score, keep, you know, rules, obviously standings and all that stuff, which is not a huge deal. So uh, Alper's condition was, you know, this can't be a gimmick. It can't be just for press. Uh, so we, we need to make it a, a serious uh, project that's designed to, you know, theoretically last into perpetuity, not, not something that's supposed to just be put together and disappear. So it needs to be a viable ongoing league plan with a minimum of one year, uh, you know, one season to run. So that's the minimum viable plan. So that's where we're, we're, what we're doing. Uh, I, I do think it's a really good idea and it's worth chasing this all the way down. Uh, especially now. It's a totally different situation than it was a year ago when we looked at this the first time. A lot less complex, actually, from the standpoint of putting it together because, again, you don't really, you're not dealing with anything but the broadcast. 
So uh, anyway, that's where we're at on that. So the survey that I sent out, uh, I did get a statistically significant result uh, on the three questions. The, uh, the looks like about 75% of the people ranged from extremely happy to uh, happy with the return of sports, even in the current configuration, the way it looks. Uh, they're fine with it. So 75%, and that ranges from about 55% that are, uh, you know, happy to uh, about 10 each that are very and extremely happy. Uh, only a handful of people are interested in their own YouTube sub channel, so it's probably a premature conversation. I, I kind of expected that because I really haven't fully explained how that would work and give an example. So we'll we'll, we'll table that for for now. In terms of the uh, ask me anything session, I didn't get but a tiny handful of people that expressed interest in this. Uh, so I'm back to the same statement I've made before that there are no big questions out there. Uh, I've actually put these together in the past and uh, even people that confirm they would show up didn't show up. So there are not big unanswered questions out there and any any commentary that direction is, is misleading. So uh, if I get enough uh, requests for this kind of a thing, then of course I'll hold it. But I've done it two or three times in the past and and even conf confirmed people didn't show up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna table that. That's it's not a real thing. Uh, USPS is slowing down for sure. Uh, for sure, from I would say even just two or three weeks ago, I have mail that moves around consistently that I can I can tell how long it's gonna take to get from one place to another. For for certain, that is that is uh, slowed down. I would say by about half in the last two to three weeks. So. Uh, market maker, so make of that what you will. I've never seen it before in all of the years that I've been mailing things and I've been a commercial mailer before, um, you know, going back about 20 years. So something very unusual is happening. Uh, market maker program. Now, I just want to mention this has been online for, for three years now, uh, about three years nonstop. And the people who have participated in it, there's been uh, on and off about a dozen various times coming in and coming out. They earn rewards uh, in terms of uh, free stock grants in the company and uh, bonus margin and things like that. So it's been going for three years quietly in the background. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everybody who is part of that because it is an essential thing that is uh, keeping the market stable and keeping uh, the or you know keeping the gaps closed on on bids and asks. So thank you for that. Governance model. So I like the credit union. We talk about bank stock market. Um, I like the credit union governance model better. So I want to take a closer look at that in terms of the banking side of it uh, and how it's governed. The XFL sale was uh, cheap. I just want to make a comment here. The reason it's cheap is because uh, almost all league startups fail and this one will be on its third go. So that's the reason. Um, and tangling themselves up with gambling, I don't think is the way out of this. That's probably part of what they're putting in their new business plan, but we'll see. Um, I don't think that's going to do it either. So that's why it's so cheap. And again, this is why our market proposition, being able to raise money through uh, a new method, so the sale of sports performance, Basically, investing in sports performance instead of betting on it. That's our proposition. That's what we're about. That's a better idea. It's only a matter of time before we prove it. Uh, the sportsvote.com. So just to explain what this is for, sportsvote.com is going to be a central property. Uh, that's the YouTube channel. That's where it's going to land. You're going to start to see things, uh, not just videos added, but other changes as improvements being made to that. Um, the sportsvote.net is the online petition. Uh, please do sign it and pass it around. This is going to count in the future. We've been do we, this petition's been alive for more than five years now, I think. Uh, so we need we need to be adding signatures to this uh, as often as we can, as much as we can. So please uh, sign that and pass it around if you haven't. Uh, that's the sportsvote.net. Uh, so dot com is uh, homed on the YouTube channel. .net is the petition and .org is going to be where the toolkits are for, uh, for the sports vote. Now, what does that mean? That means tools to get the message out, 
to explain what, what is that we're doing here, just like any other political campaign. That's the idea. Um, so, you know, what do you see when you go to a political website to take action? In, a, in this case, it will be spreading the message. It'll also be tools related to uh, the teams and the leagues, right? That information on listing your league, um, you know, how to get that word out. Basically, you know, the sports vote is the vote for the new sports economy. The idea is to go from the old sports economy, which is gambling, to the new sports economy. So the, the, the fulcrum between those two is the sports vote, okay? Vote for sports, vote for sports investing. Okay, so that's what this is all about. So .com is video, YouTube channel, .net is the petition, .org is the toolkit site, which is going, .org is just, uh, I just put it up a couple days ago, and so there's nothing to see there yet, but you can check it from time to time. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be, you're going to see it develop into a, uh, into a fully working site. I'm not going to just flash it on from, from not there because we're not promoting it anywhere uh, so if you just want to see the progress, you can go to the sportsvote.org for that. I'm just going to leave it up real time so that you can watch the development in real time. A comment on uh, regulation. Um, I'm, I'm very unhappy with the way that things are allowed that should not be and things are not allowed that should be. So while you're off, uh, and yes, I'm addressing you directly, uh, while you're off approving things like DraftKings to go public when the Wire Act clearly prohibits interstate gambling and continue to let crypto flourish when it serves no useful purpose whatsoever, uh, in fact, usually results in constant scams and schemes ranging in the hundreds of millions to billions of dollars that end up in the courts, uh, you don't pay attention to the things that you should pay attention to, like 15 years of solid effort, including hiring people from your backyard and people that you told us to hire uh, to pr promote something that will help people instead of harm them, you leave that stuff on the sidelines. It's pretty obvious why, and this is uh, going to have to be fixed at some point, and that's there's more money in bad, bad moves than there is in good moves because you're not going to be able to show me or anybody else with a straight face how DraftKings is helping the world be able to become a better place or how Bitcoin is become making the world a better place. There's 10 stories a day on scams and, and, and crashes and lawsuits and scandals and people being murdered and all that. But that's fine. It's just fine to just carry on with that. Then you come after people like us, and I'm sure there's others. The only reason this is happening to me is so that I know about it in general for the world, that these kinds of things happen. I've certainly read about these stories uh, happening, but I've never experienced it. So I guess I needed to experience it so I can tell the story to everybody else. I don't think it's particular to me. I don't think the system cares that much about any one person, no matter who they are. Uh, but I do think it indicates something that is going terribly wrong inside the system that is causing these outcomes. And that's the reason that it even landed in our lap. So something is terribly broken. If this is how things are done and if this kind of thing is happening widespread which is guaranteed to be the case um, that's the only reason i know about it uh, then then yeah it's a mess and maybe this whole deep state thing is a problem and you know maybe i've got the wrong read on this and maybe the the i mean i think those words and that branding are deceptive and designed to cause fear and, and confusion but maybe the the bureaucratic aspect and the momentum inside of this and the incentive structures, I think that's where the real problem lies. One of those has just been fixed with the teeth being knocked out of the SEC on their disgorgement stuff. Now they have to actually show that there's been a, an ill-gotten gain and that wasn't the case before. That kind of direction is the right direction to be headed because as it stands now, the outcomes are not good outcomes. The bad things that are harming people are, are, are not only being allowed to persist, they're being amplified and the things that are helpful are being squelched. And if that continues, then the Republic will suffer for it. It's, that's, it's just that simple. If those things continue, if you continue to suppress the good and you continue to amplify the bad, the outcomes will be horrendous. Okay, so 
If that doesn't matter, if you don't have any kids or anybody in, that you care about that comes after you, okay, then continue. And the result will be the failure of the American Republic, period. So laugh all you want. This will be the case. Gambling is for losers. I get a lot of pushback on this, and that just tells me I'm on to something because gambling is for losers, <laughs> okay? I don't know anybody who's proud of it, okay? So ask yourself this question. Why can't you boast about it? If it's such a cool thing, if it's such an awesomely cool thing, then why can't you outwardly boast about it? Zach made a comment that really struck this home in like the shortest number of words, okay, of any package I've ever, package of words I've ever heard. How would you feel about your daughter if you had one coming home to you one night and telling you that he's decided to marry a professional, or she's decided to marry a professional gambler? How would you feel about that? that that's the whole story in one single idea. So I think it, I think it fits. I think if the shoe fits, wear it. Uh, you know, if we were in the same situation, if the if the tables were turned, the gambling people would be saying that investing is for losers. Okay, it doesn't really play, does it? <laughs> Try selling that line. You're not you're not going to be able to sell that line. So I'm thinking really hard about going out with this message hard because controversy creates coverage. So if you want to tell me that gambling is not for losers then show me, show me that. Prove that gambling is not for losers because either you're a professional gambler, which means you're fleecing all the people that don't know any better, the losers, okay? Or you're the owner of the casino. That's it. There's only two parts to that. So if you're the owner of the casino, whether you make or lose money is not my problem. In fact, I'd rather you lose all the money, okay? because you're stealing it from people. One. Two, you're a professional gambler. Go find something else to do other than fleecing people that don't know any better. Okay? Uh, I'm going to say this, and it's a very bold claim, but I'm going to say this right now on the record forever. No matter what happens with the SEC case right now, no matter what, it's not going to have any negative impact on, on our trajectory our upward, upward, not downward, not horizontal, upward, okay? It's not going to harm us no matter what. Now, I've been holding to say this for a while, but it's, it's not just me saying it. It's a consensus that I trust, okay? So if you're thinking that that trigger is going to flip at some point and the game's over for us, it's not true, okay? It is not going to have any more negative effect than it has already had, okay? That cost has already been sunk. It's already been paid. It's already been absorbed. It's already old news, okay? Old news. Big 10 Pac-12 canceled. Okay, so what's left? Let me guess. The red states, okay, we'll see how far this gets. Uh, I don't think it's going to get very far. The 1950s atomic age, um, if you go back to the marketing materials, the advertising stuff, the news coverage, I really think that that period, uh, it's pretty universally accepted now, I think, by most American historians, that that period of post-World War II, uh, that was really the, the go, go, go time for America. And I think that, that uh, trying to reach back to that is, is why we're getting uh, this ill-conceived version of retro America or, or the idea of that. I, I think what they're trying to capture is that spirit, which I get. I mean, if you go back to some of those commercials and things, I mean, it's really incredible how far ahead we were able to see. And that was, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Um, I think there's some inspiration to be had for us from that period. 
and also some messaging cues that we can take from that. I mean, I said that in the Costa Rican period for ASM that there was this heavy desire for going back, uh, you know, back to the good old days. And I, I don't, that hasn't changed. I mean, I, that should be very clear now, especially with the election of 2016. So I don't know where this is going. I'm just saying that spirit, okay, the spirit of that age, of the atomic age, especially the 1950s era, not, not so much the 60s, because the 60s turned into more, I think, fear-based and more, it, it, that turned into the hippie culture and all that, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that I think the industrial uh, rise and the anything is possible ethos really is about the 1950s space age kind of uh, period. So that's kind of captured my imagination right now. I don't know what it, where it's headed, but it's it's. Uh, I think it does say something about what we're doing and kind of our angle on messaging. So um, both markets will split October first, twenty twenty five to one. Uh, that's uh, that was not timed with Tesla. I'll, I actually saw that after. Um, I mean, I had I had heard something about a split. But the idea of splitting ASM would actually went back to Jason's uh, uh, Jason conversation before summer of last year about splitting the market. So I I didn't I was just paging through the prices and looking at both sides of the market, and I I noticed across the board everything appeared to be high. So that's that drew my attention to it, and then the announcement, and then the date. So we will do that on the first of October across the board, both sides of the market, all tickers. Uh, it will be. It will take place over a number of days because it's a technical process. Uh, we'll have to talk about the open orders and and how that is done. If they're, you know, because I have to be can there'll, there'll be a cancellation of those. So a more a more uh, fine description of the process, a more detailed description of the process, will take place um, as we get closer, weeks ahead for sure. So transaction tax. So we talked about this even in the Costa Rican period, and now I'm seeing this is being um, this is being shown as a as a a live case. A live case in the market is being played out right now. Uh, interestingly, with with DraftKings. So we need to uh, put, as I mentioned in the last video, uh, a, a transaction tax built in. Interestingly, I said that last Sunday, and then this week, this excise tax is being levied against the uh, gambling operators. This is a too big of a thing to talk about now. It's more than just a transaction tax on them. It's actually reclassifying them as a gambling outfit, even the daily fantasy part, which is going to be problematic uh, for their claim that the daily fantasy is not gambling. This is the whole David Bowie's. Uh, bullshit legal operation along with all the rest of this conflicting legal opinions all over the place. This is what happens when you pay a mercenary to go in and lie to the court over and again in multiple places. You end up with a bunch of conflicting legal opinions or going all different directions. If you didn't actually have to lie in the first place, here's the thing. If you didn't have to lie, you wouldn't need the fucking lawyers. Okay. So, that's what the fucking lawyers do is they fucking lie about shit. That's their job. That's their job, okay, is to create these cocked up Rube Goldberg legal opinions that nobody can figure out. Well, IRS says DFS tickets are, are, are taxable wagers according to federal excise. <laughs> so this apple cart hasn't even started to be knocked over. I'm going to leave it alone because I'm sure next week it's going to be a hot topic of conversation. What is important is that they put the tax on them, okay? And what I have said internally going back 15 years is you got to do that stuff up front, okay? So in our case, we should put that transaction tax in the system. And I'm pretty sure we said that almost from the very start, even going back to Costa Rica days, up front because you're never going to get it in after the fact. It's always a big fight. And that's part of the... Uh, the fix for the economy and everything else. So um, 
it just proves that you, if you do it right in the first place, instead of this constant patch up job along the way, it works out a lot better in the long run. Maybe it takes a lot longer. Okay. So daily fantasy has been breaking the law and hiring expensive lawyers to try to explain how it's not breaking the law all over the country. Only to be found out that ultimately they are breaking the law. Okay. And that daily fantasy, basically what the IRS has done, and you're going to see this, <laughs> What the IRS has done is say that, uh, nope, daily fantasy is a gambling just like everything else, and it's taxable under federal excise tax for gambling, just like Vegas pays on their wagers. Guess what? All daily fantasy is now gambling. No more of those lies. So all that, oh, it's skill based. That's all gone. Okay, you're gambling just like everybody else. And then the tricky part. <laughs> so they just took daily fantasy and declared it all gambling. Which, which they, they, they spent millions and millions, God knows how many, tens of millions, I'm sure, tens of millions of dollars on lying lawyer dirtbags to say that it wasn't gambling. Now the IRS says, oh, yes, it is, and you're going to pay tax on it. So that's a mess, okay? You watch. That's a mess. Uh, and it's going to roll starting next week. Not a positive development for the gambling shysters. So new accounts are, are, I'm getting very old, like back to 2014 ASM learning market, very first days, 2015 and 16 uh, pilot market, first uh, very early days, people that are um, claiming the bonus margin credit and trading for the first time and, and then staying. When we already knew this from Costa Rica, once they get in, they stay in and they keep trading. So that's happening. Tax rates are being pulled out of a hat. So I, I read, well, equivalently listen to about five, uh, some months, 10, it depends, between five and 10, 250-page books a month on various topics that I think will be helpful to us, uh, policy things, tax economic stuff. Um, and I've come to this conclusion, it's taken a lot of books over many years, that the tax rates that you see, uh, it's almost, it's hard to say this out loud because it's hard to believe, but most of the time the tax rates that you see are pulled out of a hat. They're not, now, the initial tax rates, now they're adjusted over time based on modeling, but when you see an initial tax rate, like 23 and a half percent. They didn't get that out of a model. <laughs> they got that literally out of a bag of numbers. Okay, let's try it and see what happens. Uh, that's actually a very big surprise to me. I was under the impression, you know, all my life up until about last week, after m probably more than 100 books on the topics that would bring me to this conclusion over 15 years at least, that this was all some sophisticated quant activity in a back room with a bunch of wizards. No, no. They get close. Usually they can get pretty close, but a lot of times it's guesswork. And <laughs> I know this from the days when I was in the computer business. If you make it look calculated, like even if you calculate it and it looks like 20% is the number, you need to actually say it's 21 and a half percent. Otherwise, people will be suspicious of the number. It turns out that they even do this in government policy, okay? <laughs> that they take the numbers and they just have a grab bag. And, and then once they start to see returns, then they can change the models. But the initial tax rates are pulled out of a hat. So just if you think that, that it's all a bunch of science behind all of this, it's not in most cases. Uh, unemployment rate is 17%, okay? Anybody who uses any other numbers than the unemployment claims that are filed with the unemployment bureaus, which are legal contracts subject to perjury and punishment, if any other figures are used, they are lies, they are twisted, they are up for manipulation, okay? Nobody is going to, almost nobody, is going to certify a legal contract, which is what unemployment insurance is. Nobody is going to do that if uh, and lie on it 
Almost nobody is going to do that. I mean, almost nobody is going to do that. So uh, the others are surveys and stuff, which are infinitely corruptible. Uh, so unemployment claims are at 17% if you use a workforce of 160 million. And I would add about 5% to that for the people who have dropped off or given up hope looking. So the unemployment rate floor is 17, and I would say the top end of that right now is 22%, period, or I'll eat my shoes. Let's talk about DraftKings. So DraftKings uh, released their non-earnings report for the second quarter of uh, 2020. A very, very small advance in revenue very small and they were talking about oh boy it's going to be huge it's going to be massive people are gambling on casino games now remember they wrapped this together with a sportsbook licensing software company so there's more to the numbers than meets the eye okay this is no longer just DraftKings by itself this is DraftKings with a software provider wrapped in okay so to have a very tiny increase and the casino games and all the rest of that so that entity's income consists of the broader marketplace not just DraftKings so a very small income that's top line gross that's like gross dollars in okay that's that's not playing accounting games. That's one dollar comes in as a deposit to an account or whatever. Dollar in. That that number only ticked up very very slightly, okay? Very slightly, in in view of having this software company behind and the casino games and all of that stuff. The losses ticked up drastically, way beyond the analyst numbers. Now analysts do not miss by this amount. The analysts missed by more than twice, okay, approaching three times the number. That means one of two things. They're either in on the fix and they're out puffing the stock, puffing the stock, hyping the stock, or they don't have any idea what they're doing. Because if you watch the other markets, the regular markets in other industries, analysts don't miss by three. If you say earnings per share is 20, you don't come off at 55 cents a share loss, okay, <laughs> which is what happened here. So not only are they not taking in money at, at nearly the faster rate that they should be, okay, because this, the, one, two, the losses are almost three times higher than the income, okay? So once again, each quarter this continues to be true. The income is rising slowly, the offset is even faster in losses than the income, okay? So income rises slightly, losses ride, rise rapidly, okay, and at a faster rate. So that is not a good case. That's increasing losses based on <laughs> increasing sales at a faster rate. So how many more quarters of this exactly uh, are, reaches... Uh, uh, Income rises, losses rise more. How how does how does this meet here even to get to even when the numbers are are going further apart? I don't understand it. So maybe somebody can explain that to me how that works. How many more quarters of this puffery are we going to get? Okay. Yes, you have a billion dollars of cash. You're going to need it. <laughs> You're going to need it. You're going to need to keep raising cash to keep paying the $150 million a quarter that you're losing, okay? That's, I mean, that's $600 million. Actually, it's closer to $200 million. So you're, you're losing almost a billion dollars a year. So, yes, you're going to need a lot of cash to keep doing that. So that's not impressive that you had. You mugged the public for that. That was a nice trick. You drove the price of the stock up to 45 whole bunch of your insiders cashed out. That was you paid yourself. That's nice and sweet. Meanwhile, the market price of your stock has been tanking ever since then, and your reporting numbers get worse every quarter. So, hey, regulators, there's a job for you. There's all kinds of good stuff happening in there. Why don't you go check it out? Look, we make money 
the day, the first day, the first day that we have the exemption or the regulation, exempt market, paperwork, regulated market, we turn a profit from the first day. First day. First day. So anybody out there that maybe wants a better horse, maybe you should give us a call. We're not looking for cash right now. That's not the problem to solve. It's actually the other way around. We're looking for a league we can finance. We, we, can, we can make the rest of it go. We just need somebody to fund. I'm confident once that story goes out on the wires, the problem of getting a company funded to the moon is not going to be the problem. The IRS ruling on DraftKings, again, more shortcuts. You know, this is what happens when you shortcut, 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 greedy, 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 shortcut, bang, the IRS hits you. Watch the news next week. It's not going to be pretty. Volume on both sides of our market, learning market, pilot market, it's almost even. It's almost, I've never seen this before. This is a brand, I, and I don't have a theory yet as to why. The learning market and the pilot market are trading about equal volume which is very, very positive news. I just don't know why, and I, I don't have, I'm not gonna put a theory out on it because I don't know why. It, it, I know basically why is that they're taking it seriously, which is good, but why it's happening now and it didn't happen before, I don't know why yet. Uh, another interesting thing is, is that no matter what bonus margin people claim from these various offers that go out, they do not waste it by and large. Uh, they spend it carefully. They, they treat it as if it were money that should be treated with respect on both the learning dollars and the pilot market uh, bonus margin, which is also uh, great. It means, it means the market is being taken seriously. That's really the baseline message it, it, it gives. Um, this is a war of attrition. I said that really 15 years ago, and I have witnesses for that. It is our job to stay alive and keep this product out there and in front of people and continue to prosthetize it and get the message out. And if we keep it alive, our moment will arrive. Keep it alive and our moment will arrive. There has never been a groundswell for onshore gambling. That's always been put by the gambling operators. None. There has not been people marching in the streets. You don't have a base camp set up outside City Hall here. There has never been a protest that I've ever seen anywhere in the United States screaming for legalized sports gambling. And here's the reason why. You can get it offshore, and you can get it cheaper, and you can get it without tax implications. <laughs> you can get better odds. You can get it without tax implications and at uh, lower fees. So where is the impetus for this sports gambling coming from? It's coming from the greedy operators of the gambling outfits, and it's coming from the greedy leagues who are not realizing they're actually destroying themselves. The end. <clears throat> There's never been a groundswell for it. It's always been driven by the industry. So... You know, I mean, it comes down to this. I mean, if it's so great, why don't you boast about it? You don't, you don't boast about it. Even professional gamblers hardly boast about it. So why not? If it's so wonderful, why not? Tell me why not. It's not even credible. I mean, you know, to say that gambling or betting is better than investing, is, is it makes you sound like a, a fool, <laughs> like an idiot. Nobody's going to give you that. Nobody, nobody's going to give you that. Nobody. They'll look at you like you've lost your mind. Um, we got an actual for the first time. Now, this did happen in the Costa Rica days. We got a question about whether or not we're going to be offering options on the market. So that's, that's good to see. Uh, I said not yet. Not at this time. Build back better. Stop betting. Start investing. Build back better, stop betting, start investing. And that's a much bigger message than just about sports. So two things I think everybody can identify with, and this is where my head is on the toolkit, okay? 
When I mean the new sports economy toolkit, I mean a way for you to participate in building the new sports economy, okay? Personally, for yourself. You know, that's, that's what this, this political action is about. It's not, it's not just spread the message to spread the message. Spread the message as a political campaign, as an issue advocacy campaign. And then the toolkits, and to put the toolkit in perspective, I think there's two, two uh, sides that everybody can identify with and I think properly capture it, okay? The California gold rush and wildcatting for oil in Texas, okay? That's where my head is on putting together an action kit on the, new, on the sportsvote.org, okay? Remember, dot .com is video, dot .net is the petition, and dot .org is the toolkit, where you can begin to put your own tools together to build something, a personal business, a, a micro business or a, a macro, a major mega business around the new sports economy as a wildcatter, if you like that uh, analogy, or, or the California gold rush. I, I don't think that's out of place. I think that that is uh, fitting. Okay, so so that's kind of, and I may just mix those together because it seems those are two different ethoses or two different now, especially more than ever. That's red and blue, whatever. I mean, it's whatever. However you want to look at it, I'm, the the gold the gold rush and the wildcatting came before the current election situation and the current political climate. I'm saying those ideas, I think, properly capture. What I feel is going to happen for everyone, okay, why, why you should support this. And those tools, I want to give those away for free. Uh, you know, the stuff I can give away for free, I mean, this, you know, the electronic stuff, you know, which is free. It's hosting charges, but that doesn't amount to much. I mean, it's all really just electronic tools, mainly, okay, to, to build your personal stake in the new sports economy as a gold rusher or as a wildcatter, depending on how you want to look at it. And then finally, and th you know, this is a, not about creating a company. I, in the way Elon sees Tesla as a spawn for electric cars, which unquestionably has happened, this is the same concept in creating the industry around sports investing, okay? Sports performance investing, sports performance investing, right? This is about creating industry. Of course, we're creating a company that is supposed to spawn an industry, but really the macro idea is building an industry. And as, as Biden says, and I agree with, America's about possibilities. Possibilities, that's right. And that's what I want everyone to see with, with the new sports economy and what we're building with ASM and through ASM. A return to that kind of big thinking, you know, that we can do something big and new like the space age, you know, something that big, that kind of a quantum leap in thinking, this time centered on sports, which touches everybody's lives. I mean, it's the most pervasive thing there is that everybody can touch. So that's what this is all about. That's why I spent my life working on this. That's why I'm still here working on this, no matter what comes. That's what I believe we're doing, is building a new future around sports as the center of society, as the chief organizing principle of society. So if you're behind that, please support us any way you can, even if it just means having people try out the website and, uh, and see what they think about it. And, and as always, you can send feedback to support at allsportsmarket.com. We're going to consolidate everything to that address, so all the other addresses will be taken down. So, you know, it's just too much to manage. So please send anything and everything to support at allsportsmarket.com. And again, please stay safe with your family and your friends. Please do treat this um, coronavirus seriously. Um, it, is, it is not a joke. It is not a... Uh, it is not a overhyped. Uh, it is a serious public health threat. And if you missed my previous video, I personally uh, know somebody who, uh, who died from it. So, and it wasn't the flu. So uh, bye now. And I will speak with you again uh, next uh, Sunday.